In accordance with Standing Order 43, the time for member statements has concluded. And we uh, move to questions without notice. But first, the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, the uh, minister that was just rightly being lauded by uh, the member for Banks, the Minister for Trade and Investment, will be absent for question time for the remainder of the week as he travels to China to participate in the Australia-China high-level dialogue. The Minister for Foreign Affairs will answer questions on his behalf. We move to questions without notice. Are there any questions without notice? I call the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Yesterday, the Prime Minister said that the government's broken promises and unfair budget were just a matter of atmospherics. When will the Prime Minister accept that it's his $100,000 university degrees, not the atmospherics, that Australians have fundamentally rejected? I call the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, is it in order for the Leader of the Opposition to misquote the Prime Minister in a question and then demand an answer to a misquote? Surely he should be required to quote the Prime Minister accurately and not make assertions based on a misquote that the Prime Minister never made. I think the proper way to deal with it is that there could be a point of personal explanation at the end of question time. But I would advise I don't think it's a good idea to, without, without putting a basis a, a basis I'm speaking at the moment resume the seat that the base, that the basis uh, for a question is a quote without uh, being able to substantiate it and I'll check the standing orders but I suspect standing order 100 there's something to say about it facts and names of people unless they can be authenticated and are strictly necessary are not in order. So, if the Leader of the Opposition would take that into account. Do you want me to authenticate the quote? Yes, I would, please. I'm quoting from a 46 minute session of the Prime Minister with the Gallery, dated 1 December 2014. And the Prime Minister said, So, I'm not for a second suggesting that last week was a great week when it came to the atmospherics. This, the, then, further uh, on. No, the, the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. Now we are now we are now getting into the realm of argument, and that also is not within the sound of order. There will be a silence on my left. If the prime minister feels he knows what the content of the question is, then he can have the call to answer it. Well, ma ma Madam Speaker, I'm I'm used to being verbal by the leader of the opposition, but I think. Uh, I think, uh, I think it's pretty clear what he's on about. Uh, he's, he's claiming, Madam Speaker, that there is something fundamentally wrong, something fundamentally wrong with the government's uh, uh, proposals for higher education. Well, Madam Speaker, as I've done before in this House, so let me quote again Labor's Assistant Treasurer, who said, and I quote, Australian uni and I am exactly quoting Labor's Assistant Treasurer. I'm not reading anything into it. I'm not paraphrasing him. I'm not making this up. I'm quoting, I'm quoting from someone called Andrew Lee, who had this to say in his book Ideas for the Future. Australian. Madam, Madam Speaker, I'm, I'm The member from will remove his prop and hand it in to the attendant. Now, Madam, Madam Speaker, in his in his book, Member for Port Adelaide, in his book, Ideas for Our Future, Labor's Assistant Treasurer said, Australian universities should be free to set student fees according to the market the value of, of their degrees. Universities and will have a strong incentive Adelaide. to compete on price and quality. Much needed additional funding will be available to universities that capitalise on their strengths the for and develop compelling educational offerings. The result, he said, will be a better funded, more dynamic and competitive education sector. And Madam Speaker, and Madam Speaker Professor, Professor Ian Young, 
Professor Ian Young, Jagger, 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 and Chair of Hunter. the Group of Eight Universities and Vice Chancellor of the Australian National University, in an address to the National Press Club just a couple of months ago, said of the government's policy, and I quote, deregulation is a game changer and a building block to making our universities brilliant. That's what he said. Deregulation is a game changer and a building block to making our universities brilliant. On behalf of the Group of Eight, I urge our senators to give universities the freedom to be brilliant. Change has to happen, and I refer Professor Young's comments to the Leader of the Opposition. I call the Honourable Member for Lyons. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister update the House on how the government is building the foundations of a stronger economy that will benefit all Australians? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam the Speaker, uh, for Morton. this has been a year of achievement uh, for our country and it's been a year of delivery for this government. Uh, Madam Speaker, the, the carbon Prime tax Minister is your seat. We are not going to have a performance and a repeat of last week. We are going to have some silence and we are going to listen to answers just as questions are listened to. Prime Minister. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. I, res I absolutely appreciate the ruling you've given with respect to calling out. But surely, when people spontaneously laugh at something the Prime Minister says— I'm not referring. The member will resume his seat. I said we're going to have silence for questions and silence for answers. Now, I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, 2014 has been a year of achievement for our country, and it has been a year of delivery uh, for this government. Uh, the carbon tax repeal delivered. The mining tax repeal delivered. Stopping the boats delivered. Free trade agreements with our three biggest trading partners delivered. Red tape reductions delivered with 58,000 pages moved from the statute books to the history books. Uh, big new road projects underway. The national broadband network rolling out only this time with realistic uh, budget uh, and timetables. Uh, and budget repair, Madam Speaker, it's taking place despite Labor's sabotage. Budget repair is taking place despite Labor's sabotage. And, Madam Speaker, the changes that this government has made are making a difference to people's lives. The carbon tax repeal means $550 we'll a year in families' pockets. Stopping the boats means that hundreds of people uh, are now not drowning at sea. Uh, as they were under the policies of members opposite. And, Madam Speaker, building the roads of the 21st century means that we are giving commuters their lives back instead of having them stuck in traffic jam, jams for hours every week. So we are getting the fundamentals right, and because the government is getting the fundamentals right, confidence is returning to our economy and our country. Madam Speaker, uh, the National Australia Bank's monthly business survey showed the largest monthly gain since 1998, putting business conditions at their highest level since 2008. And according to Dun and Bradstreet, 74 per cent of businesses are more optimistic about growth in the next 12 months than they were uh, in the last 12 months. The job market is strengthening. Uh, there have been 123,000 new jobs created this year. Jobs growth has been more than twice as fast this year than last year, and Madam Speaker, consumer sentiment is above its long-run average level, as the latest ANZ Consumer Confidence Survey shows. Madam Speaker, retail sales are strong, and housing starts are near record levels. So, Madam Speaker, this government is doing exactly what we committed to do to build a strong and prosperous economy for a safe and secure Australia. I call the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Yesterday, the Prime Minister dismissed criticism of the government's broken promise as an unfair budget. It's just a matter of atmospherics. When will the Prime Minister accept that it is unfair GP tax, 
not the atmospherics that Australians have fundamentally rejected. Yeah. I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Ma Madam Speaker, um, again, uh, the Leader of the, the Opposition failing the to accurately quote what I said. But, Madam Speaker, uh, the Medicare co-payment uh, is uh, exactly the same in principle as the PBS co-payment, which members opposite support. Yes, it it's exactly the same principle uh, as the PBS co-payment, which members opposite support. And, Madam Speaker, it's precisely, it's precisely uh, because uh, members opposite are not prepared to accept uh, the principles of budget responsibility. They are not prepared to accept the need for budget repair. Uh, that, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, that this country got itself into the debt and deficit disaster that members opposite created. Madam Speaker, this is what we are doing. We are repairing the budget. Members opposite are sabotaging the budget. There are $28 billion uh, worth of savings. Uh, that members opposite are holding up in the Senate, including $5 billion worth of saving that the Leader of the Opposition supported uh, when, he was, uh, uh, when he was the kingmaker uh, or queenmaker in the previous government. Uh, and, Madam Speaker, if members opposite were in charge, the budgetary position would be $43 billion worse than it is. So, Madam Speaker, uh, there is a very simple lesson here. You just cannot trust the Labor Party with public money or with economic management. I call, I call the honourable member for Murray. I thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer inform the House how the government has put in place the foundations for a strong and prosperous economy to ensure a safe and secure Australia. I call the honourable the treasurer. Well, I thank the uh, honourable member for Murray for her question because she recognises, as to all my colleagues, as to the people of Australia, that uh, you have to undertake change, and it can be difficult change in order to and earn the, the growth Hunter. and earn the prosperity that is going to come to Australia's advantage over the years ahead. And at the beginning of this year, we started the process by commencing budget repair. As a result of our initiatives, we reduced the debt of Australia by $300 billion over a decade. And as a result of our initiatives, we were able to roll out the largest infrastructure program in Australia's history. And as a result of what we've done, we've been able to facilitate significant state economic reform through our asset recycling program that has actually turned the tide in the states to start delivering new infrastructure that is productive on the back of asset sales that should have happened years ago. And as a result of this government's initiatives, we've been able to privatise Medibank private, with the proceeds going back into new infrastructure investment and that sale alone, the third biggest initial public offer in the world this year, raised a billion dollars more than was expected in the budget. And on top of all of that, we removed $2 billion of red tape, repealing, tearing up 57,000 pages of legislation. 57,000 pages of red tape for business. We tore it up this year. <clears throat> and I know it's hard. I know it's hard. As the member for Murray and others on my side and all sides know, ending the age of entitlement for industry was a hard decision, but it needed to be made because, as a result of that decision, we were able to get free trade agreements with Korea, Japan, and China that the Labor Party could never deliver. And as a result of what we've done, we have made the government smaller, McMahon. abolishing 76 agencies, authorities and boards. We've approved $1 trillion of new the projects, for 300 major projects as a result of environmental fast-tracking. We've rebuilt employee share schemes after the mess that was made by the member for McMahon. We're fixing the problems that Labor created. And one of those problems was 100 unenacted tax initiatives that were dating back more than a decade. A hundred announcements from Labor the for and McMahon. the previous coalition government, 
and we got rid of them. We dealt with them so we get rid of uncertainty for business. And on top of all that, it's the coalition government, the Abbott government, that has facilitated economic growth, that has delivered twice the number of jobs created in Australia each month than created under the poor economic management of Labor. I call the honourable member for Wakefield. Thank you, thank you, Madam Speaker. It, it, it's a pleasure to still be here. Um, my my question is to the Treasurer, and I refer to today's editorial in the Australian, which states says that the, the Treasurer is has been invisible, and argues that if he is not hungry enough, he should hand over to Malcolm Turnbull. Is the Treasurer hungry enough? I call the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, ministers need to be asked. The Leader of the House has the call. Madam Speaker, ministers uh, need to be asked questions within their area of responsibility. The Treasurer is happy to answer the question, but question time should not be an opportunity. I heard the point of order being made by the Leader of the House, but the Treasurer has indicated he's perfectly willing to answer the question, and therefore I give him the call. Well, I thank the honourable member for the question. And um, yes, I am hungry enough to be able to want to fix Australia. I am hungry enough with all of my colleagues to set about the path of fixing the mess that Labor left. I am hungry enough to be able to work night and day with all of my colleagues to strengthen the nation, to and build a stronger budget, to and create jobs Lincoln and create warm. prosperity. And I tell you and what, there is no one, there is no one that I have forgotten on the other side because I have a little library. I have a little library. I have a little newsletter here called Nick Champion MP Standing Up for the North. Budget newsletter 2012. 2012. Hey, Swanee. Sit up, Swanee. Remember 2012? I have no intention of listening to any of those points of order. I will simply say to the member, to the minister, that he will refer to members by their correct titles. Yesterday it was just a member for Shorten. Shorten. Now, now. Uh, I tell you what, now he needs three defenders. I mean, by the end of the week, everyone will be standing up to defend his legacy, except him. Except him. Because I tell you what, I was looking at this newsletter. I was looking at this newsletter and I, from the, uh, the honourable the member, member for Nick Champion, update on the two. The member for Wakefield and he says has asked he told his question, his... put his prop down. Put it down. Put it down. I'm reading. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm reading. I'm reading for the newsletter of the. Oh, the, the treasurer will resume his seat. Yesterday, with a sense of humour, one on your side of the house asked me whether or not he should raise a point of order to ask why the member for Wakefield was still here. <laughs> now, I think you're answering that question yourself. You have asked your question and will remain silent while we hear the answer. The Treasurer has the call. Well, Madam Speaker, it's arguable that the member for Wakefield has never been here. Because, because he sent a newsletter out, he sent a newsletter out to his electorate, to hundred thousand of his constituents, and he said the following The government's strong economic the management has brought quiet. the budget back to the surplus. Member for Wakefield. Has brought the budget back to surplus. He was never here. He was here for the speech. He was here for the commitment at this dispatch box from the member for Lilly that they were going to deliver four surpluses in a row. But the thing is, Labor never delivers. Labor actually never delivers. And it's a reflection on Labor that they make these sort of commitments. And it's not just a promise. He says, actually, Labor brought the budget back to surplus as if it happened yesterday. The Madam Speaker, Labor never brought the budget warm. back to surplus. 
Labor never actually was responsible responsible when it held the Treasury benches. I'll say this to the member for Wakefield. This side of the parliament is absolutely determined to do what's right for Australia. We will not rest until we see a stronger economy. I call the honourable member for Denison. Oh, the uh, honourable member for Wakefield on a point of order. I, I just seek leave to table the editorial from the Australian to, yeah, for the day. You know perfectly well it's a public document and therefore not eligible for tabling. I call the honourable member for Denison and we will have some quiet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My, thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education. Minister, as you know, I oppose your tertiary sector reforms. But quite apart from these reforms and my concern with them, the University of Tasmania is one of the biggest employers in the state and has developed plans for deep restructuring, capital investment and increasing warm. student numbers. Minister, further to our discussions about the university's plan, what commitment can the federal government now give to help fund this exciting project? I call the Honourable Minister for Education. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'm very grateful to the member for Denison for asking me a question about the University of Tasmania's restructuring proposal. And can I say that he, along with the members for Braddon, Bass and Lyons, have been great advocates for supporting higher education in Tasmania, particularly the opportunity that the government's reforms give for the University of Tasmania to take advantage of those reforms and to restructure their operations, because the University of Tasmania is the second largest employer in Tasmania. And the government's higher education reforms give UTAS the chance to massively expand, the, through the demand-driven system, their pathways programs into the sub-bachelor courses like diplomas and associate degrees. And with those extra students, with that extra revenue, spend more on research, more on teaching, more on infrastructure. So the government does encourage the University of Tasmania to pursue its restructure, but the restructure cannot occur without the government's higher education reforms, because otherwise there will be buildings across Tasmania as part of the University of Tasmania that don't have students to fill them because the rest of the government's higher education reform will not have been passed. Can I also tell the member for Denison, because he quotes the University of Tasmania and he says that he doesn't support the government's higher education reforms. University of Tasmania is part of Universities Australia. Universities Australia have spent weeks, if not months, in this building trying to convince the Labor Party, the Greens and the crossbenchers to vote in favour of the government's higher education reforms. So, in fact, University of Tasmania is in favour of those self-same reforms that the member for Denison has opposed in the past. So I would urge the member for Denison to get on board with the government's higher education reforms, because if he does, he's getting on board with the University of Tasmania. And if he does that and these reforms pass the Senate today or tomorrow, then the University of Tasmania will not only be able to restructure their operations, they'll be able to thrive in a deregulated environment where they can do their very best quality work even more and better, and they can also provide the vital pathways programs to Tasmanians to get into undergraduate degrees. Because as he would know and I know, Tasmania has the lowest participation the for rate in higher education in Australia at 6.7 per cent. And I want to, and the member for Bass and Braddon and Lyons, and I'm sure the member for Denison, all want to give Tasmanians the same opportunity as mainlanders to get to university and the benefits that that brings. I call the honourable member for Gilmore. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture. Will the minister outline to the House what Australia's free trade agreement with China will mean for our dairy industry, and particularly to co-ops like the South Coast Dairy in my electorate of Gilmore? I call the Honourable Minister for Agriculture. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And I thank the Honourable Member for Gilmore for her question. Madam Speaker, I had the uh, pleasure last week of going down to her seat, to the Member for Gilmore's seat, where we start, we turn the sod on the first on the, on the dairy, on a new dairy, a new dairy cooperative, Madam Speaker. A dairy cooperative made up of seven farmers. They're going to uh, 
take a benefit out of the exports that we will get out of our free trade agreement. Well, I'll get to you the in a second. We will get out of our free trade warned. agreement. Our free trade agreement, and this is good because we are removing all the tariffs, all the tariffs on dairy gone, all the tariffs, so the people of the south coast can start getting the same benefits that the people of the north coast get. We are now exporting more than 17,000 litres of fresh milk a week. A week. These are the sort of benefits that happen. So we've got small cooperatives reaching down the supply chain, reaching down the supply chain to get a better return to their farmers. Just like we've got new investment now in southern Queensland, half a billion dollars, Prime Minister, going into the dairy industry, going into the dairy industry so that we get a better return, a better return for our farmers. Now, the member for Gilmore understands this because she's a businesswoman. She actually ran a business, had 40 staff, 40 staff exported to six countries, so she knows the benefits of what happens from free trade agreements and how they help. The other thing that the member for Gilmore was, she was also on the uh, regional development board. She was on the regional development board, and that's, that's interesting because you think that whilst we were getting the free trade agreement together, that what was the other side doing? What, what could they possibly have been involved with? And so um, we had a look at it. Of course, in the, in the RDA boards, and the RDA boards is rather interesting. Because there were some interesting propositions there, some interesting propositions there that should have got more attention, such as the WA Goldfields Outback Way Priority Section upgrade, which was rejected. An upgrade to save people's lives, an upgrade to move exports, an upgrade that would actually have helped regional Australia. Because the way we see regional Australia on this side of the house is dark, starry nights, furry animals on the road, long distances between towns. But where's regional Australia for the other side? Where is regional Australia for the other side? Well, whilst they rejected that, where, who did get money? Who did get money? Well, they found a regional town called Sydney. They found a regional town called Sydney. And who got $7.3 million? Well, the member for McMahon. The member for McMahon. You, what part of regional Australia is Fairfield in these days? What part of regional Australia is Fairfield in these days? And whilst the people, whilst the people in Narandra couldn't get youth off the streets. You got your money, didn't you? And I can see the member for Wakefield. He's gone awfully quiet, haven't you? Because you also got money, didn't you? Yes, there's another thing. They say now that our Treasurer said that you couldn't deliver, but you can deliver to one group. You can deliver to yourselves. You can deliver to yourselves. You look after yourselves, don't you? The Minister is in his seat. <coughs> the member for Isaacs on a point of order. The Minister should be asked to address his remarks through the Chair. The uh, minister has the call. They haven't got much to go on, have they, Madam Speaker? And what about this one? The Regional Physical Activity and Education Centre for the member for Fremantle. What part of regional Australia is that in? Your orders. Well, the member for Hunter. Do you want to deal with that first? Do you want to deal with it? Oh, uh, this is not a discussion time. This is question time. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Are uh, you on a point of order? First of all, I'd like to ask, invite the minister to withdraw. No, look, I looked at this question yesterday. I've taken a look at the precedence. There's nothing to withdraw. The member will resume his seat. Uh, Madam Speaker. If an individual, if it applies individually to a person, then there may be a case to be made out depending on the context, but not otherwise. So the member will resume his seat. No, I don't think you do. The member for Morton will desist. Very quickly on your second point of order. Very quickly, Madam Speaker. Uh, I asked the minister to table the China FTA from which he was apparently reading. The member will resume his seat. Was the member reading from confidential notes? There's no point of order. I call the honourable member for McMahon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. And I refer to the Prime Minister's promise only 56 days ago that he would, and I quote, bring our country back into broad balance by 2017-18. Does the Prime Minister stand by this commitment? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister and there will be silence on my right, including the Leader of the House. <clears throat> we'll have silence. Prime Minister has the call. Madam, Madam, Madam. Sorry. <laughs> there will be silence on my left. The Prime Minister has the call. 
Ma Madam Speaker, it would be a lot easier to bring our nation back into broad fiscal balance if the member for Mount handed back the $7.4 million that he was improperly granted, so it seems, if the Australian National Audit Office uh, is to be believed. Now, Madam Speaker, this government is absolutely— yeah, The member for Grainger will withdraw. The member will withdraw. I withdraw. Is determined to restore the budget to surplus as quickly as we reasonably can. Uh, this government made a series of fundamental commitments to the Australian people in the lead up to the election. We said we'd repeal the carbon tax, we'd stop the boats, we'd build the roads of the 21st century, and we'd get the budget back under control. And that is exactly what is we are doing. Exactly what we are doing. And, Madam Speaker, we will deliver. Unlike members opposite, um, there's uh, all sorts of libraries around. The um, member for Sydney. I've got the assist. Shorten Library, Madam Speaker, and let me read from uh, Mr. Bill Shorten's budget news. The member for McLean has uh, asked his question. He, will said, silent. he said Australia's economic report card back in surplus on time as oh. promised. In these uncertain global times, there's no clearer sign of a strong the economy than a certain. The, lip. the member for McMahon on a point of order. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On relevance, the Prime Minister was asked about the what he Prime said just Minister 56 days ago. The, ma the member for McMahon. Oh, the member for Grainger is going to have a chance too. Yes, thank you. On a point the of order. The Leader of the House can withdraw the accusation that he made across. The member for McMahon has received no money, Correct. Madam Speaker, and it is an outrageous slur, and it should be withdrawn. The member for Grainger will resume his seat. If the Leader of the House has made a remark which he— If the member for Grainger will remain silent. The member for Isaacs does not assist. If the Leader of the House feels, feels he has made a statement that could be interpreted as being a slur, he would withdraw draw to help the House. Yes. The member for Greenlaw on the point of order. Yes, Madam Speaker. Uh, when I made an unparliamentary comment, I was asked to withdraw, and I did so immediately and unconditionally. And unconditionally. The member to accuse a member of parliament the member of money is a serious accusation. And the member shall resume his seat. The leader, the leader of the House has said that he did not make that statement. The Leader of the House. I'm happy to clarify for the House. I made the point that he should give the money back from the Rural Development Assistance Fund, which doesn't belong in Fairfield, it belongs in rural Australia. I didn't imply that he had taken the money personally. He did so on behalf of his electorate, and it was wrongly given to that electorate. It should have been given to regional Australia. The matters at an end will move on to the next question. Or oh, the Prime Minister has the call. Well, Madam, Ma Ma Madam Speaker, this government uh, is determined to bring the budget back to surplus as quickly Member as possible. Uh, members opposite used to think this was important, uh, as is illustrated by the book of Shorten, which says in these the uncertain global Adelaide. times there's no clearer sign of a strong economy than a surplus. And then he went on to say, and talk about misleading. Uh, the Australian people, we've delivered a surplus on time as promised. Well, Madam Speaker, what a fabrication. What a fabrication. Now, Madam Speaker, we are doing our best, despite the sabotage of members opposite, to bring the budget back to surplus, to deliver the surplus that Labor promised but never actually delivered. And, Madam Speaker, one of the ways to do that. Uh, is to expose the kind of rorts that we've just seen in government programs under members opposite. They 
established a re regional development assistance fund, and what's absolutely obvious is that it was utterly rorted by members opposite, including, it seems, delivering $7.4 million to the member for McMahon's seat, which should not have been delivered. Before the member for Grainler, the member for Grainler will get off his high horse. The member for Grainler is warned. Now, before I call the member for Hindmarsh, I wish to advise the the, uh, the chamber that we have within the speakers' gallery the member. A member of the Victorian Legislative Council, Mr. Simon Ramsey, MLC. We make you welcome. The member for Hindmarsh has the call. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education. Will the minister explain how the government's higher education reforms will make our universities internationally competitive and benefit students? What alternative is there to the government's plans? I call the Honourable the Leader of the House and Minister for Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I thank the member for Highmarsh for his questions. And he asks me what alternatives there are to the government's plans for higher education reform in Australia. And the alternative uh, is the Labor alternative, which was $6.6 .6 billion worth of cuts. When Labor was in power, they cut the universities by $6.6 .6 billion. They didn't give the universities any opportunity to replace that revenue. They therefore broke their promise that they'd made before the 2007 election, where they fooled academics and university uh, officials into believing that they would put more money into higher education. In fact, they took $6.6 .6 billion out, Madam Speaker, and now, with their soulmates, the Greens, in the Senate, they are attempting to stop this government from allowing the universities to gain the revenue that they need from students at a 50-50 split so that, on average, students will pay 50 per cent of the cost of their education and the taxpayers will pay 50 per cent of the cost of students' education. They are attempting to stop the government from being, from being allowed to give universities the chance to be world class. They are attempting to stop the government from spreading opportunity to tens of thousands of more first-generation university goers, low socioeconomic status students from rural and regional Australia who we would be able to help through Commonwealth scholarships targeted at rural and regional low SES students by expanding the demand-driven system to uh, sub-bachelor courses like diplomas and associate degrees. The Shadow Minister, Senator Carr, has made it very clear why, Madam Speaker. He's told Vice-Chancellors that Labor wants an election. They believe they will stop the reforms and force the government to the polls. He told the Australian Financial Review Conference on Higher Education in November that Labor would win the next election and force this government to the polls, and that that was the reason they were voting against these reforms in the Senate. So they are being the usual vandals that they were in the Howard government, the vandals that they were in an economic sense in government under the Red Rudd, Gillard Rudd governments, and now they are being vandals because for Labor it's always about politics. It's never about policy. It's always about politics. It's never about people. On this side of the House, Madam Speaker, we want to give students the opportunity to get the chance to have 75 per cent on average higher incomes over a lifetime by getting to university. We want our universities to be world class. So we're for good policy and we're for putting people first, Madam Member Speaker. For Sydney. Labor, on the other hand, Labor, as usual, Kim Carr's admitted it. Putting politics first, people second. Putting politics first, policy second. So I call on the Senate, I call on the crossbench to pass our reforms and give our universities the best chance to be internationally competitive. I call the honourable member for McMahon. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Yesterday, the Prime Minister dismissed criticism of his broken promises and unfair budget as just a matter of atmospherics. If yesterday was about the government resetting the budget, why is the Prime Minister still ramming through his unfair petrol tax ambush? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, we are determined to do what members opposite never could, to restore fiscal responsibility to this country, to the finally give has been this country a surplus. You know, Madam Speaker, 
Members opposite have the not delivered a surplus since 1989. Wyatt Roy wasn't even born when members opposite last delivered a surplus, but, Madam Speaker, they've sure, to, they've sure talked about delivering a surplus. They've sure talked about it, Madam Speaker. Listen to with the member for McMahon. Listen the member to the member for, for McMahon. The government has returned the budget to surplus three years ahead of schedule. So, you know, they're not just promising it; they've done it. They've done it. The government the has returned the budget Griffiths to surplus three warm. years ahead of schedule, and ahead of any other major advanced economy. And the debt and deficit campaign is now exposed for the fraud that it always was. Well, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, uh, debt and deficit is all members opposite know about because it's all they are capable of delivering, debt and deficit. Now, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, this government— The member for Sydney is warned. Ma ma Madam Speaker— The Prime Minister has the call. This government, Madam Speaker, this government doesn't just talk about delivering a budget. We actually take the difficult but necessary decisions that are necessary to make it happen. Uh, Labor said it had happened, and it never did. Uh, we are actually doing the difficult but necessary decisions to give Australia the budget surplus that members pro promised but were never actually able to deliver. The member for Griffiths can have an hour outside under 94A. I call the honourable member for Mitchell. Better than the last member for Griffith. Um, my question, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer outline the status of the budget measure titled Research and Development Tax Incentive Better Targeting, announced by the member for Lilly in February 2013 and documented in the 2013-14 budget? I call the honourable the Treasurer. Well, I thank the honourable member for his question and note his uh, forensic approach. To the history of the member for the Lillian, member the history for of Labor and government. And this is important. On the 17th of February last year, the member for Lilly, as Treasurer, announced $1.1 billion in savings relating to research and development tax breaks for the largest companies. He said at the time, the change will affect less than 20 corporate groups and will ensure this support is better targeted to small and medium businesses. Savings from these reforms will fund government priorities, including measures announced in the government's industry statement, a plan for Australian jobs. The next week, the member for Lilly recommitted to this saving, saying to the Australian business economists, we said we would remove the R&D tax concession for large companies with a $20 billion Australian turnover and more to ensure innovation spending is directed to where it will have the biggest benefit. And this is a down payment on the repair that the budget needs. Now, I thought to myself, well, I accept that. The Labor Party says that they are going to crack down on the 20 biggest companies in Australia who are taking advantage of R&D tax breaks in order to fund the budget repair job, in his words. We actually came into government and said, yes, we're going to do that. Labor never legislated it. We introduced the legislation and Labor opposes it. Labor opposes their own savings measure not for Gonski, but to fix the budget. And I thought to myself, why would they do that? Why would they do that? Why would they go back on the word of the member for Lilly? And I came across the answer. Because the very sloppy member for McMahon, who doesn't know the difference between gross debt and net debt, doesn't know the currency of China, he, he doesn't know the difference between regional and metropolitan Australia, the member for McMahon said, now, you're referring to one specific tax change which the previous government did flag to fund Gonski. Nothing of the sort. Nothing of the sort. And I thought to myself, he surely can't keep getting it wrong. The member for McMahon surely can't keep getting it wrong. And then I heard the Prime Minister just there say, the government, the quoting the member for McMahon, the government has returned the budget to surplus three years ahead of schedule and ahead of any other major advanced economy. I thought, well, that's the mantra of the Labor Party. I thought, Swanee said that, and he got it wrong. And then I looked at the date of the statement. The statement from the member for McMahon was two years of the head of member for Lilly. 
Hang on. He was claiming on 2010, the 13th of May, on Fran Kelly's ABC national program, that they had delivered surpluses. He was even ahead of the worst treasurer in Australian history. No wonder he's writing a book about treasurers. I call the honourable member for Jagger Jagger. When you go in poorly, bring in poorly. There will be silence on my right and left. The member for Jagger Jagger has the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Why is the Prime Minister still determined to ram his attack on pensions through the Senate? Doesn't this mean nothing of substance has changed and there is no reboot? Yeah. The member for Hermit will desist. I call the honourable the Prime Minister. Uh, this is a government which is determined to deliver the surplus that members opposite promised but could the never member for actually Jagger, Jagger manage. Asked a question. Madam Speaker, uh, this government is serious about doing the things that the member for Jagger Jagger just talked about. She just the member for about. Jagger Jagger. Well, Madam Speaker, the member for Jagger Jagger, I mean, uh, you know, the library that the uh, Treasurer talks about, uh, um, this is from the Book of Macklin. And, uh, the member for Wakefield. The Book of Macklin. Is Australia's economic report card. Back in surplus, on time, as promised. Returning to surplus gives the Reserve Bank flexibility to cut interest rates further. Well, we never got back to surplus, did we? That's the whole problem. The Prime Minister will resume his seat, and the, me the uh, member for Jagger Jagger will resume her seat. She does not get up to argue. The Prime Minister has the call. Now, Madam Speaker, when it comes to the pension, uh, all we want to do is give to pensioners the same indexation rate that the member who asked the question gave to people on family tax benefits. So, Madam Speaker, um, the member who asked the question can shout and scream across the chamber as much as she likes. Uh, she, can, she can say unfairness as much as she likes. But, Madam Speaker, if it was fair to do this for the family tax benefit, as she did, well, then it's perfectly fair for other social security benefits. Now, Madam Speaker, this is a government which is determined to keep faith with the Australian people. And, Madam Speaker, uh, we keep faith with the Australian people by bringing the, bringing the budget back under control. We are repairing the budget. Members opposite are sabotaging it every day. I call the honourable member for Hasluck. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on the Australian National Audit Officer's report on the administration of the Regional Development Australia Fund? Why is it important to be careful with taxpayers' dollars? I call the Honourable the Treasurer. Well, I thank the Honourable Member for his question. And and, and the Treasurer will resume his seat. We will have silence for the answer. The Treasurer has the call. Uh, well, as the honourable member knows, every taxpayer's dollar is precious. Every taxpayer's dollar is precious. Unfortunately, the Labor Party, the Labor Party, doesn't accept that. Now, Madam Speaker, the Labor Party and government rorted, rorted the Regional Development Australia Fund. They rorted the Regional Development Australia Fund, and the ANAO. The Australian National Audit Office identified how the Labor Party did it under the leadership of the member for Ballarat. The member for Ballarat, you see, if you fail in the Labor Party, you actually get promoted. That's why he's the leader. But the fundamental point is that the member for Ballarat was found to engage in the solicitation of, of a rort on Australian taxpayers' money. And why? Why? Well, the member. The Treasurer will resume his seat. The member for Franklin on a point of order. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The point of order is relevant. They funded the 50 member will of these resume projects. Her seat. The member will resume her seat. The Treasurer has the call. The member for Ballarat, as Minister for the Regional for Services, Franklin Local Communities and Territories. Hers. 
commissioned a panel headed up by her own Labor Party members to advise her on how to distribute the funds. And the audit office the has member found for will bring that the a member quarter for of all order. projects, a quarter of all projects representing $109 million, had not been recommended for funding by the advisory panel headed up by the Labor Party. So, hang on, what happened? $91 million spent the by member the for member Chifley. for Ballarat actually was recommended against by a Labor panel. The Treasurer resume his seat. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. Uh, Madam Speaker, on reflections on members, the Treasurer is now asserting that an independent panel was run by a political party. There is no point of order. The Treasurer has the, there will be silence on my right and the Treasurer has the call. And the member for Barker. Yeah. Let's be clear. This member as a minister specifically approved $91 million of allocated taxpayer money to purposes that her own Labor panel refused to support and, in fact, specifically recommended against. It goes further. It goes further. 64 per cent. You can't run protection the, uh, here, mate. The it's an audit report. Seat. The member for Grandler on a point of order. Yes, Madam Speaker. To make an accusation against a member must be done by substantive point. This is not a Labor panel the member, anymore member than infrastructure. The member will resume his seat. The member will resume his seat. The member will resume his seat, and the leader of the, the leader of the House will desist. I warn the Leader of the House. <laughs> and the member for McMahon is never likely to play in a team that has the likes of Mr Lazarus in it. The member for has the Treasurer concluded his answer? No, I call the Treasurer. Oh, they're not getting off on this, Madam Speaker. So of the $91 million that that the then member minister, for is the member for Ballarat spent, for one hour of that $91 million, 64 uh, per cent went to ALP-held seats, are using taxpayers' money before the election against the advice of a panel headed up by a Labor person. And they were so appalled, as was the audit office. There is now a report that demands that the member for Ballarat come to the dispatch box and explain in full, explain immediately to Australian taxpayers why she was engaged with the Labor Party in rotting taxpayers. I call the honourable member for Sydney. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Why is the Prime Minister still cutting $80 billion from schools and hospitals as outlined in his own budget overview? Doesn't it show that nothing of substance has changed right. and there is no reboot? The member will put down her prop. These, this is, these are the graphs the member will speaker, put that show down the cuts. Her prop. <laughs> Prime Minister has the call. Well, Madam Speaker, uh, for the benefit of the member for Sydney, who asked the question, uh, public hospital funding goes up 9 per cent this year, 9 per cent next year, 9 per cent the year after that, and 6 per cent in the final year. Uh, school funding goes up 8 per cent this year, 8 per cent next year, 8 per cent the year the after that, Sydney and 6 per cent the year after that. And uh, in so silence. What the uh, member for Sydney says is simply false. Simply false. The what member we for have Sydney has been warned. In respect of schools and hospitals, is exactly what we promised before the election. I call the honourable member for Hughes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Will the Minister advise the House whether any health projects were deemed suitable for funding under the Regional Development Australia Funds Grants? And what are the ramifications of poor decision making in managing taxpayers' money? I call the Honourable the Minister for Health. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and I uh, thank the Honourable Member very much uh, for his question. This is a 
portfolio, which manages uh, about $70 billion a year, and the person who seeks this office, uh, if Labor were to win the next election, the member for Ballarat uh, has just been found out by the Australian National Audit Office, as was mentioned by the Treasurer before, uh, to have presided over the Regional Development Australia Fund uh, in a way that was not acceptable to the ANAO. Yeah. And I think this is a very, very serious issue that all Australians should contemplate. Australians were angry with the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd governments, very angry with the waste of money that had taken place over the course of six years, and the Australian public has not forgotten the fact that Labor ran up $676 billion of debt. The member Australia for has not forgotten that these people who sit on the front bench of the Labor Party today were many of the same players in the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd years. These people were trained by Kevin Rudd or Julia Gillard. They were incompetent when they were ministers, and they are being exposed as incompetent now as shadow ministers. And what we need to examine, Madam Speaker, is Wilson. whether or not these people are competent enough to contest the next election and want to sit on this side and manage portfolios that have to manage $70 billion in taxpayers' money. That's the important question that the Australian public needs to ask, the Madam Minister Speaker. The Minister for Health will resume his seat. The, me the member for Isaacs. On None the of this order. has the slightest bit to do with the, the man, question the, that was answered the member will relevant, resume his seat. Madam Speaker. The Minister has the call. So, Madam Speaker, I will let the Australian public judge the member for Ballarat and whether or not she is ready to take over as the Health Minister. But let me, let me ask him to rely on the advice of the, the ANAO member, the that says that she says, is— The member for Isaacs on a This point is of order. grossly disorderly. It is the willful member will disregard— his seat. This is not a point for argument, and that's all you'll do. The member will resume his seat, and he knows perfectly well that standing orders is not an opportunity to get up and argue a case. It may have been his previous life, but not here. The minister has the call. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Now, the member for Chifley. I would, uh, I would ask the Australian public to the examine the Australian National Audit Office report because the it is damning. The has been it is and damning be quiet or leave. of the Labor Party. Choice is hers. It is damning of the Labor Party, and it is part of the reason. It is part of the reason the that Labor was deemed to have 94. wasted billions of dollars of taxpayers' money, and they have not learnt their lesson. Now, we know that out of the ANA report that 80 per cent, Madam Speaker, 80 per cent of her ministerial decisions to not award funding to applications recommended by the advisory panel the related to projects in coalition seats. Now, there were two projects which were recommended in relation to health, $365,000 for a project in Gippsland and $200,000 for a project for the seat. Keith. The member for Greenlow will on a point of order. Yes, Madam Speaker. Uh, this is the Health Minister. The Minister will resume his seat. Whoever made that comment will withdraw. I withdraw. Thank you. The member for Greenlaw on a point of order. Madam Speaker, I'm perplexed at what possible relevance the point of for the Health Minister. The member for the Health Minister to have. Mr. Bell has the call. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. The now, these, these two health projects were recommended and they are overturned. Why? Because they are in coalition seats. This shadow minister, when Barrett. she was a minister for the Labor Party when they were last in government, decided to take money away from regional Australia and put it into Labor seats in capital cities. She should be condemned. The member for Ballarat will desist. The member for Chefley will desist. The member for Newcastle will desist. Will desist or leave. Choice is hers. Likewise for the member for Hotham. The member, the honourable leader of the opposition, has the call. Thanks, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Before the election, the Prime Minister said, and I quote, Australians are sick of leaders who play politics ahead of governing the country and who blame everyone but themselves when things go wrong. Isn't blaming everyone but himself exactly what the Prime Minister has done in his answers today? 
I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Ma Ma Madam Speaker, I am making the obvious point, the absolutely obvious point, that solving the debt and deficit disaster that we were left by Labor is not easy. And it's particularly not easy uh, when members opposite are not Member assisting the repair, they are sabotaging it. Now, Madam Speaker, this government takes responsibility for fixing the debt and deficit disaster that we inherited. I just wish members opposite would accept the responsibility for creating it, because, Madam Speaker, create it, they did. Create it, they did. But, Madam Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition uh, likes to quote things. Now, Madam Speaker, I think the people of Australia need to know a bit about the Leader of the Opposition. Everyone who knows the Leader of the Opposition fails to trust him. Madam Speaker, let me just uh, let me just remind the Leader of the Opposition the and, and the, the member people for of Australia and Port uh, of just what his colleagues think of him. The distrust between Rudd and Shorten was intense and enduring. The Gillard camp was contemptuous of Shorten, considering him weak and duplicitous. Neither side trusted him, the Prime and Minister neither side provided. The member for Jagger Jagger on a, on a point of order. And Come on! The member for Jagger Jagger on a point of order. Point of order, Madam Speaker, on relevance. It had nothing to do with the question. Uh, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker. Member opposition, business. Um, the, in fairness to the member for Jagger Jagger, the question was about him blaming everyone but himself, which is exactly what he was doing, and the he was completely relevant. The Prime Minister has the call. Is, he's completed his answer. I call, the on, I call the honourable member for Durack, and we'll have silence to listen to the question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Assistant Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. I remind the minister that the ANAO investigation of the Regional Development Fund reported that, and I quote, there was not a strong alignment between the minister's funding decisions and the panel's recommendations. Will the minister inform the House on how many occasions the former government approved projects not recommended for funding? I call the honourable the Assistant Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, can I thank the member for Durack for her question? And uh, it's a very important question about uh, what is a very concerning subject, Madam Speaker. An audit report which was damning at best, damning at best, that the member for Ballarat uh, and her decisions to overturn recommended uh, recommended projects, which largely fell uh, in coalition seats, Madam Speaker, uh, coalition seats in regional. Uh, and rural Australia, largely safer coalition seats, and remarkably, the money ended up in projects which weren't recommended by her, her by the handpicked panel. They ended up in marginal Labor seats, and I might just go through a few. If the uh, member for Durack would be interested, Madam Speaker, the uh, $365,000 for the multi-purpose consulting rooms for Allied Health Services in the electorate of Gippsland, it was recommended by the panel. It got cut. 500,000 for a youth off the street centre in the electorate of Riverina. It was recommended by the panel. It got cut. 500,000 for an early early childhood hub in the electorate of Parks. It got cut. 200,000 for an upgrade of the Keith and Districts Hospital in the electorate of Barker, a hospital which State Labor took, an, took the axe to a couple of years ago. It got cut. 1.7 million for an upgrade of transport infrastructure at the Dubbo Regional Livestock Markets in the electorate of Parks. It went. And 5.2 million. For a marine offloading facility in the electorate of Grey, it went as well, Madam Speaker. But what did get up, Madam Speaker? What did get up, Madam Speaker, when it was not recommended? So the panel made decisions on recommended for funding and not recommended for funding. One got 7.3 million dollars for a youth and community centre in McMahon. So in McMahon. When they thought the shadow treasurer was going under, the when they thought the member for Mar was going under, they released a dirt sheet on the candidate and they funded it unfairly. They took away money from other projects and they gave it to the member for McMahon to try and sandbag him. A dirt sheet and a bit of rorted money. The Labor way. That is Labor for you, Madam Speaker. But it wasn't just the member for McMahon. In fairness, there was 10 million in the electorate of Fremantle to save the member for Fremantle. There was 10 million uh, in the electorate of Charlton to get.
the new uh, member for Charlton elected, and seven million for the, our old mate, the member for Wakefield, who's not here in shock news, Madam Speaker. They took money from safe coalition seats and they put it in marginal Labor seats to try and sandbag. It is a disgrace. The member for Ballarat should stand at this chamber, at this dispatch, dispatch box, and apologise and explain why it was she rorted Australian taxpayers' money to try and save Labor seats. She rorted Australian taxpayers' money to try and save Labor seats. You wouldn't have done it. You're too smart to do that. The Assistant Minister will resume his seat. The member for Grangler on the point of order. Yes. Madam Speaker, what is the, uh, of order? the member, the assistant what is the point minister, of order? cannot make accusations the against member the has, member without the sustaining. The minister has the, has the call. Madam Speaker, and what's worse, in her explanation yesterday, the member for Ballarat forgot to mention that 65% of the money that was awarded went to Labor and Labor independent seat. 65%. It's a disgrace, and you should apologise. I call the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Yesterday, the Prime Minister dismissed criticism of the government's broken promises and unfair budget as a matter of atmospherics. If yesterday was about hitting the reset button, will Senator Johnson still be the Defence Minister when Parliament resumes in February? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Speak Madam Speaker, uh, of course, of course uh, the Minister for Defence uh, has uh, my support uh, and he deserves the confidence of this parliament because, Madam Speaker, what he is doing is making up for six years of neglect by members opposite. Uh, and, Madam Speaker, when it comes to the uh, Air Warfare Destroyer program, which uh, uh, was the subject of debate in the Senate last week, the Air Warfare, the Air Warfare Destroyer program uh, was $300 million dollars Jagger, Jagger. over budget and 21 months behind schedule, and the Minister for Defence is doing for what Batman. is necessary to rescue that project. But when it comes to trustworthiness and when it comes to who can be relied upon, uh, let me read uh, uh, the, the opinion uh, of uh, Julia Gillard, the former Prime Minister, uh, of uh, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Julia Gillard, and I quote, routinely referred to the likes of Albanese, Swan, Abib and Billy Shorten as the dark side of the Labor Party, numbers men who believed in nothing but— The Leader of Opposition Business on a point of order. Madam Speaker, on direct relevance. It was a very broad question. The Prime Minister has the call. Ma 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 Madam Speaker, this, this, this is the problem with members opposite. They stand for nothing, they believe in nothing, they are incompetent in government, they are wreckers in opposition. This government is fixing the mess that members opposite left us, and for the and for the nation's sake, for the nation's sake, they should stop sabotaging it. I call the honourable member for Petrie. Well thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Communications. Will the Minister please update the House? on the NBN's forward rollout plan. And Minister, what measures is the government taking to ensure the rollout continues on a predictable basis and the NBN Co's forecasts are reliable? I call the Honourable the Minister for Communications. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for his question. And the most important element in ensuring that the NBN's rollout forecasts are reliable is for the NBN to be managed in a businesslike way so that it is providing information that is reliable and forecasts that are achievable, as opposed to telling politicians what they want to hear. Under the previous government, the NBN, month after month, produced forecasts and figures that had no achievability at all. They've missed all of their forecasts without fail. Their statistics and metrics that they put out were calculated to mislead. The NBN Co under the Labor government had a measure called construction commenced. Now you would think that that involved people digging holes and trucks turning up. But oh no, no Madam Speaker, under the Labor government in that Orwellian world or that Conrovian world, construction commenced 
when you ask somebody to draw up a plan. <laughs> and that would be like saying, I've started construction on my new house. Uh, why is that? There's nothing happening on the lot, your friend would say. Oh no, I rang the architect this morning. I mean, this was the sort of madness that was pervading the whole of the NBN project. Now all that has changed. We announced yesterday, or the NBN Co announced yesterday, the 18-month rollout plan, 1.9 million premises. Construction will begin during the next 18 months. Now I hear honourable members saying, complaining that it was designed to benefit coalition electorates. Let me say to honourable members, the electorate in Australia with the largest number Member of premises that were where construction will be underway in the next 18 months is in fact Newcastle, a, a, a Labor seat. And indeed, to give you an insight in the way Conrovianism is changing to neo-Conrovianism, I have in my hand a letter from the federal member for Charlton, Pat Conroy MP, and it's very revealing. It reveals, Madam Speaker, for those that care to look at his letterhead, that he's very proud of his teeth, because there, there is not one of them that is not visible on the uh, photograph. But nonetheless, gleaming, gleaming fangs aside, Madam Speaker, he writes to me, he writes to me and urges that there be more fibre to the node rolled out in his electorate. And he calls on us to do that. Madam Speaker, when Uncle Stephen hears about this, there will be all hell, hell, hell to pay. But what he's recognising, the honourable member is recognising, that we're getting on with the job. We are getting on with the job, and indeed, there's a very large number of, of premises in his electorate where construction will commence. So, Madam Speaker, getting on with the job, running the NBN like a business, those are the markers of this government, responsible, businesslike, and focused on getting the Labor mess cleaned up. I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. I call the Leader of the House.